was lost and I'm thankful that he brought me out one more time give him a big hand clap of praise why don't you shake two or three people's hands and welcome them to Calvary Church this morning with us this morning. Welcome to the greatest place in all of Northwest Arkansas. If you've joined us online and this is your first time to join us online, thank you so very much for joining us. Can we give all of our guests in-house and online a big hand clap this morning? Thank you so much for joining us here at 107 McClure Avenue. I've just said it, but I'll say it again. This is the greatest place to be on a Sunday morning in all of Northwest Arkansas. Next Sunday, we have an evangelist by the name of Tim Green that will be joining us here and speaking into our lives of what God has laid on his heart. And I'm, I'm asking you to make it a priority to be here on Sunday morning. God is going to show up in this place and you will leave here just like today. You will leave this place changed. You will leave this place different than when you walked into it. He is a miraculous, he, he's an amazing speaker, preacher, teacher, friend. And I'm thankful, we're thankful to have him back here at 107 McClure Avenue at Calvary Church Lowell. I'm going to ask my helpers to help me take up offering this morning. I'm thankful that God has blessed this church. Amen. Got a quick second here. I, we were in Stevens, Arkansas last Sunday, and we were speaking to the pastor, and he was telling us about all these things, and the one word that came to my mind was favor. That church had, has favor with the Lord. They were, they were given the grounds of which their church is on right now. They were given a school, then they turned it into a Christian school for their community to learn the things of God. And I'm just sitting here thinking, my goodness, that's five hours away. And Pastor Needham, he looked at me, he said, Marcus, hear me and hear me now. If it can happen here in Stevens, if favor like you said can happen here in Stevens, it's going to happen in Lowell, Arkansas. Now, I'm crazy enough to believe that one of these farmers one day is going to call my pastor and say, hey, I can't handle it anymore. I need you to do something about this. Well, we're looking for some grounds for a church anyway. So I'm stepping into favor this morning, and I'm thanking God for what he's already going to bless this church with. And I know my God can, and I know that my God will. So would you stand with me all across this sanctuary? I'm fired up this morning. 
I miss being home. Preaching out's cool and everything, but being here with y'all is my favorite thing. Lift your hands with me and let's step into favor together. Lord, have your way. Lord, expand your kingdom because it's not my kingdom, God. It's all your kingdom. Let your will be done and let it be done in Lowell as it is in heaven. Let it be done in Northwest Arkansas as it is in heaven. Thank you for the giver. Bless the gift and the giver this morning, God. Bless your kingdom this morning, God. Put your hands together. Thank you for what we feel. Hallelujah. Worship with us.
you for the presence that we feel in this place. Continue to speak your word, Lord.
plead your blood over our lives in the name of Jesus. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. for the blood of Jesus. That blood that reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. It's that blood that gives me strength. Oh, you see, because I was lost in sin, but when he went to that cross for me and purchased my salvation, my inadequacies melted away and they were covered up by his power and by his grace. Can one more time, can we just begin to worship him? you are here today by the blessed blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let's just keep lifting that up to him right now. Oh, Jesus. You see, his blood is greater than your sickness. It's greater than your disease. It's greater than your anxieties. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
thank you, Jesus. I want to say thank you to this incredible team leading us into the presence of God every Sunday morning. I'm grateful for them. We've only got about three weeks left in life groups. And even though there's only three weeks left, and yes, if you haven't been, you've missed five weeks, but you're not too late. If you would still like to join, you're more than welcome to show up. You can show up on the last night if you want to. But life groups will be coming to an end for the, this year, at the end of this month. November and December, we're going to be back here in the house of God. I'm excited about that, that we're going to be back on campus for midweek. And that first Wednesday night in November, we're going to be having a worship night here at the church. And I believe we're just going to have a great time worshiping God together. I'm not going to mess it up by getting up here and talking all that much. We're just going to sing praises to God. But November and December, we're going to be back here. But how many of you enjoy have enjoyed life groups? It has been awesome what God is doing in those groups and binding people together. I've been excited about it. If you've participated, or maybe you haven't participated, and you say, man, I want to host one next time. If you would get with us, let us know that your home is available. The more homes we have that host the groups, the, the less chaotic it is. But if you would like to be a host of a home group in 20, 2023, let us know. We would love to get you connected and get you hosting a group. I believe life groups are going to be part of the identity of Calvary Church Lowell from now going forward. And I'm very excited about that. And I hope you're excited about it too. I want to reiterate what Pastor Marcus said. Next Sunday, we have Brother Tim Green with us. And you need to do everything in your power to be here next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You also need to invite somebody to come to church with you next Sunday. It's easy to do it when there's a guest speaker because you get to be excited about that. It gets boring listening to me, but you only get to hear Brother Green once a year. So make an invitation for somebody to be here with you. Let's pack this place out next Sunday. Let's, let's just see what God can do. Let's come with faith and expectation, believing that God is going to move in a miraculous manner next week. Very, very excited about that. We're going to dismiss our kids now. Our kids 9 and nine through 12 will be going to my right. If you've got children 5 to 8, they're going to be in the back of the building to the left having a great time. How many of you are grateful for our Calvary Kids teachers? So, so grateful for them, and I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I'm going to go ahead and give you a fair warning today before I start. Many times we show up to church and we hear a message and our hearts are moved and we make our way to the altar, we feel, we feel good. We like a good message preached. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you're so gracious because you could go a lot of places and hear a lot better public speaking than you get here. But I'm grateful that you allow me the opportunity to speak into your life. But there are moments in the life of a church in which sometimes you're preached to and other times you're pastored. And being preached to is enjoyable. Being pastored is a 50-50 shot. And some of you today might walk out of the room saying, I'm okay with them preaching to me. I'm not really fond of them pastoring me. And I'm okay to deal with the ramifications of you making that choice. But today I would like to maybe pastor a little bit. All right. I'm, I, hope, I hope you're okay with that. And if you clapped your hands and you're mad at me by the end of the service, then you have to now take that up with God and not me. Okay? Here's the thing I love about Scripture. We can quibble about interpretations and does that word mean that? But at the end of the day, if the Bible said it, 
and you don't like what it says, you're not mad at me, you're mad at the author. Well, I'm mad at your interpretation of it. Fair enough. But I've got the microphone. And my father-in-law is not going to unmute any of the other ones. If you have your Bible, if you turn your attention to the screen, the book of Matthew, the 28th chapter, starting in the 18th verse. Then Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All Authority. Somebody say authority. Some translations will use the word power. Somebody say power. All power in heaven and earth is given to me. Go ye therefore, make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end, to the very end of the age. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I am grateful for your power. I am grateful for your authority. I am grateful, God, that when we are called by your name, when we are covered in the name of Jesus, when we have been indwelt by your spirit, then you, God, have granted us power and authority. And Lord, I pray that your word, not my word, your words would go forth today. God, that hearts would be ready to receive. God, let it be a good soil. God, let it take root. Let it find its way to do the work that you desire for it to do in this congregation. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We've been talking the past few weeks here about spiritual warfare. We've been talking about prayer and worship and the tactics that the enemy uses in order for us to not do those things. The fact that the enemy wants to distract us and cause disunity and cause us to rebel and cause us to be apathetic. Last Sunday, we talked about things that we can do and we talked about worship and we talked about surrender and we talked about having power and authority in the name of Jesus. Because when I go to do battle with my enemy, I want to have power. And when I go, when I, if I'm going to get into a fight, I would like to know that I'm bigger than the person that I'm fighting that morning. I'm just looking out in this crowd today, and there's some of you I would more readily pick a fight with than others. You look around, you size up the room, and you know that, you know, I may or may not have good odds with them. Like, Jeremy Eastman can probably outrun me, but I feel like I've got some weight on him, so, you know, we can go, but... I'm not letting Jeff Miller get a hold of me. I'm just not, I'm not going to do it. Like there's just, we're not balanced right there. I remember in high school, some friends of ours, we thought it would be a really idea to get into boxing. And so instead of doing it like we should and going and joining a gym or anything like that, we just went and we bought gloves and we went into the backyard and we had guys get into a circle and we got in and we just, you know, first rule of fight clubs, you don't talk about fight club. But we would get in there and we would start throwing punches and we weren't worried about things like weight classes or anything like that. And so I'm, I'm a scrawny little guy at this point. I'm, I'm, you know, probably about, I mean, I'm not much shorter than I am right now. I'm 5'10 and a half on a good, way, good day. I lied on my driver's license and said 5'11. You know, but I'm about... I'm about 5'8", and I am nothing but skin and bone. I'm not really a fighter. So imagine little old me getting in the ring, the ring being a circle of high school boys that won't let you out of said ring. And I match up against a guy that I don't know. I would say he's Brother Marcus's size, but he was bigger than Brother Marcus. So here I am about 5'8", and here this guy is about 6'2". Here I am weighing about 120 pounds soaking wet. Here's this guy every bit of 220. And we get in the ring, and we're going to box. And I don't land a single punch. But I do break my nose in an effort 
to do this. We would get together every week and we would box and we would box in backyards and in garages. And one time when it was raining, we thought it would be a good idea to have a boxing match in the living room of my mother's house. Somebody threw a wayward punch and it hit the chandelier again. How are you punching like this? I don't know how it works. But it broke the chain that the light was hanging on. So we're wondering what to do. So somebody gets up there and ties it up with some string. And it wasn't until a few years later when my mom was sitting in the living room and looking up at her light and saying, when did that chain break? I don't know. <laughs> Plausible. I, mean, I don't know what, when, when that happened, but we, we weren't worried about power dynamics. We just wanted to get in, get in and have a good time. But let me tell you this. The person who was bigger always had a little bit more fun than the smaller guy. It's always more fun to be powerful than it is to not be. When we think of going to prayer and going against our enemy, we love the idea that I've got power power in heavenly places, that when I speak the word, that the angels will go at my command, and the word will be done, and God will be faithful, and the enemy cowers when I begin to speak the name of Jesus. We love to have that image of power and of prayer and then of spiritual warfare in our lives. And when we feel we don't have power, then we don't it was almost perfectly timed. When we feel we don't have power, there's something about when our prayers go unanswered that we seem to stop praying because I feel like my prayer has no power. There's something about a church that you get into when you begin to see the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy and tongues given, and healings, and miracles, and the gift of faith present in a church. And I've seen that begin to happen, and I've seen the congregation, the body of a church, begin to swell in growth when the power of God is on display, because I want to be there. I want to be where the Spirit of God is. I want to be where the power of God is. I want to go where when I pray, my prayers are answered. There, there's that, that palpable, tangible presence of God. There's that connection to the power. And I've seen churches swell as the power of God begins to move in their midst. But we do have to be careful when we have a fascination with signs and wonders. Because Jesus said it's an evil and untoward generation that seeks a sign. It should not be that we should go from church to church looking for signs, but instead it should be that we seek out the face of God where we are and say, God, here I stand. Show me a sign. I want the gifts of the Spirit to be present in this church. I want gifts of mercy and leadership and giving and generosity to be loosed in this church. And I want miracles and healing and faith and diverse tongues in this church. I want every gift that God promised in Scripture, I want it present in this church. Because I believe a church that operates in the gifts is a church that is powerful. I believe it's a church that has authority. And sometimes, well, they're having revival over there. I guess I'm going to poke my head in and see what's going on. Be careful that you're not just chasing a sign because you'll hop from place to place to place to place. I have seen people that in their lives, all they do in church is they chase after revivals, yet they've never been involved in starting one themselves. This is, this is the curse of the small church. This is the curse of limited space and limited opportunities and limited ministries. And I've heard it a thousand times. And I've had people say to me, well, pastor, we need to be over there for our children because their children's ministry is X. And I'm like, if you would stay, we could have a children's ministry. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm preaching my feelings right now. Y'all, y'all forgive me. Oh, pastor, their youth group over there, my kid needs that youth group. If your kid goes, we don't have a youth group. Now, now, let's be clear. There are times and moments in your life, in your relationship with God, and for the sake of your family, there are certain moves and transitions that have to be made. I understand it. God has called me to pastor with an open hand, and as easily as people walk in, people walk out, and I, I believe that. I'm an open-handed pastor. So you know what? I, I, I understand that. I do understand that. But there is a time and there's a moment in our relationship with God and in everything that's going on that we sometimes have to look out and say, God, did you call me to help dig it out here? Or did you call me to go and to be a beneficiary of their blessings over there? And sometimes you get to be the beneficiary of blessing. There's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes God says, if you would just dig it out right here, 
then the miracles that I'm going to do and the ownership that you're going to take and what is going to take place is going to blow your mind. I've been a part of a church that was having revival. I've attended a church that was in the middle of revival, but I've also been a part of starting the revival. I've been in the prayer meetings that never seemed to end. I've been a part of the continual fasting and um, submitting ourselves to the Spirit of God. I've been in the services when they were dead and they were dry, but every little bit and every week after week, we began to feel the presence and the Spirit and the warmth of God that would enter into that room. And we look back to what we were and we look at where we are now and we say, my God has brought us a mighty long way. So maybe you've been called to dig it out. Maybe you've been called to give. Maybe you've been called to work. Maybe you've been called to sacrifice. Maybe you've been a part called to be a part of the kindling that sets the fire ablaze rather than a participant that stands around a fire that already goes. There's a fascination, though, of course, with the gifts of the Spirit. I remember when I was young, we had a minister that would come to our church every year, sometimes a couple times a year, and he was mightily used in the gifts of the Spirit. I saw him prophesy to people. I saw him, I saw him pray for people. I saw cancers removed from people's lives. I saw, I saw remarkable, verifiable, doctor-verified healings in the house when the minister would come and the minister would preach and he would declare those things. And there was just a faith and an anticipation and an expectation, God is going to move. And I can remember in my youth, I was young and I was planning, me and my friends, we were going to move to Nashville. Our band was going to go to Nashville and we were going to become the next big thing. We were going to be radio, radio stars. What am I in the 1940s? <laughs> we were going to take our show on the vaudeville circuit. Uh, we were going to be rock stars. We were going to make it big. And we hadn't told anybody our plans because that's what we do as teenagers. We make gigantic plans, but we inform none of the authority figures in our life because all they're going to do is, you know, I don't know, ask me to be responsible. And I remember sitting in a service, and I remember this minister was preaching, and as he began to talk, and he began to talk about power with God and having a relationship with God, and I can remember two distinct things about this service. One of the things that he said was, if you're ever given the choice between having a relationship with God or power with God, always choose relationship over power. But the next thing that I can remember is he turned and looked me square in the eye. And as I sat on the front row of that church, pointed his finger at me and said, no. <laughs> and he didn't know what I was thinking about. And nobody of influence knew what I was thinking about. But he sat there in that church service, pointed his bony finger at me, told me no, and told me to stay put. And you could hear a pin drop on the carpet. Some kind old woman in the church came to me afterwards say, Alan, are you thinking about moving? I said, no. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he must have been talking to the guy behind me. But the Spirit of God spoke. But it always stuck with me. And it always stuck with me, kind of the juxtaposition between those two things. Because I felt like I was in a position in my life. I certainly wasn't chasing power with God. But I was chasing power. I was chasing influence. I was chasing fame. I was chasing notoriety. I wanted power. He said, no, you stay put and you get a relationship. You stay put right here. You dig your knees into that carpet. You bury your face in that altar. You find yourself a relationship with God. And he will give you power, not for power's sake, but for his sake. So you stay put. You hold on. You dig in because God's going to do a mighty work in you. We have it in this world. There's a fascination with power. Power isn't an evil in and of itself. I'm reminded of what Uncle Ben said to young Peter Parker with great power comes great responsibility. You can have power. There's nothing wrong with that. We all desire power so we can right the wrongs of the world. There are so many campaigns in our society right now to win our emotions in an effort to right all the injustices of the world. They will tell you that right now every problem that exists in the world, whether it's between the sexes, whether it's between the races, whether it's between demographic groups, it's, it's an imbalance of power. And if you could just shift the power, things would be different. If you would just shift the power from the oppressor to the oppressed, then things would be better. But I often wonder if we shift the power from one to the other, then what, what prevents the other from becoming the oppressor then? 
Certainly, I wish that no one would be an oppressor and no one would be oppressed, but this is part of the problem of the world that we live in. And this is part of an apparent problem that many people have with God, and that is the problem of power in this world, and that is the problem of pain in the world. It's been written by theologians and philosophers and skeptics how they have asked the question, if God is all-loving, then how can he be all-powerful? Or if God is all-powerful, he cannot possibly be all-loving. And they think they've caught God in a paradox. Two truths in a single statement that seemingly contradict one another. It's petty and it's simplistic to try to define the, to, to try to define the God who is all-wise and all-knowing and all-powerful by our finite human terms and limitations. In theory, then, you and I, we wield the power of God and we make these grand statements. If I were God, anybody ever mused on that one for a minute? If I were God, there would be no hunger, poverty, oppression. If I had the power, if I were God, all the needs would be provided. If I were God, if I were in charge, if I was the one who wielded the power, then everything would be better. And in our infinite understanding, we fancy ourselves to know more than God does. For some reason, we have a problem with God's power. How can a loving God send somebody to hell? Has anybody ever asked that question? I'm, I'm not raising my hand as, I'm raising my hand because I've asked that question before. We try to reason and we try to rationalize the decisions of the creator of the universe as though you and I have some sort of understanding. And the problem is that everyone without something knows exactly what they would do if they had it. Those who have no power know exactly what they would do if they had power. And those with no money know exactly how they would spend it if they had it. And those with no children know exactly how they would raise them. And they offer their advice to people with kids. Now, let's be honest. A broken clock can be right twice a day. I've heard some really great observations from people with no kids. But then I've also heard some really amazing things. I'm like, that is so cute. (laughs) Just you wait. My kid will never. Famous last words. It's the first time parent that knows more than the parent who raised six kids already. Well, I understand, but I know I know what works. I'm like, I've done it six times, ma'am. I haven't done it six times, but, you know, collectively the Grinkos have done it 32 times, Um, give or take. And I'm sure that there are many in the room that know exactly how you would pastor a church if you were doing it right now, because we can always do better than the person who has the power currently. And we ask questions. And there's nothing wrong with questions. I'm, I've said it before. I am not scared of questions because I don't believe that God is scared of questions. Job, even in his faithfulness, if you read the book of Job, and Job, who is a man who is blessed, who is rich, he is a man that has everything he could dream of, and in an instant, it is all taken away from him. His wealth is taken away. His children are killed. His relationships with his friends are strained. His own wife tells him you should curse God and die. And there are 37 chapters in the book of Job in which he and his wife and his friends discuss what's gone wrong in Job's life. And his friends tell him everything that he has done wrong because obviously they haven't done anything wrong because they've not been visited by such terror in their lives. But Job, you must have something wrong. But in chapter 38, The 38th chapter of Job is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. God begins to speak, and he speaks for the next few chapters. And God comes on the scene, and he begins to talk to Job. The Bible says there, The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Imagine God coming and talking to you this way. You have words, but you don't know what those words mean. He goes on and says, brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you will answer me. If there's ever an appropriate time for a grown man to pee his pants, it's right now. (laughs) It's this moment. 
When the God of the universe stoops himself down, whether in a cloud or in a fire or in a theophany, but whatever manner that God chose to appear to Job, here he is looking him square in the eye and saying, what are you talking about? Man up and talk to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Like, you got to read this. This this is passage is one of the reasons why I think God has a sense of humor. And it's also why I think sarcastic people also bear the image of God. <laughs> who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its corner stone? Tell me, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who did these things? He says, while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, I had the heavenly hosts praising me for what I did. And now you and your circumstance are going to question me and my use of the power that I have. In the 16th verse, he goes on and he says to him, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. The 21st verse, he says this. Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. (laughs) Read that and tell me God's not sarcastic. So sometimes I have to remind myself that when my children have a sassy mouth sometimes, their respect is not placed in the correct place. But you know what? Their ability to use wit, well, that just reflects the image of God. (laughs) So that sassy mouth child needs some direction, but they've also got a gift that they got from the creator of the universe. (laughs) You've been around so long, Job. (laughs) I'm sorry I forgot to talk to you. Before I wrecked your life. Job, I understand that you have a disagreement with the way my power is wielded. But Job, let me tell you something. You don't understand the half of it. And this goes on and on and on and on. And so I say it again. You should never be fearful to ask questions of God. But you got to be ready for God to ask questions in return. Anybody ever argued with Scripture? Almost every time I read it. Well, God, why did you choose the foolishness of preaching? And God says, you got a better plan? Why must there be hell? Why must there be damnation? And God says, well, surely you know better than me. Well, God, do you really expect me to live a life that is separated from the world around me? And God says, what would you choose? Tell me your alternative. To what I've chosen since you know so much. See, we got to understand that if we want to have power with God, we have to understand where all the power comes from. If we want to criticize his use of power, if we want to criticize how, where God chooses to pour out his anointings and where God chooses to pour out his blessing, and even when God chooses to show judgment, then we got to be ready to have an answer because I trust that God knows what he's doing and that I might just, I might not have a clue. It's rare to get me to admit that, but there it is in that moment. My, now my wife says, now, now do that with me. <laughs> Fat chance. Um, <laughs> we understand you know, that's all the power in that relationship. And every man said amen. Or every husband, not every man. We look around the world and we think to ourselves, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why do blessings fall on bad people? But my friend, it's not ours to question why God does what he does. I'm not saying you can't, and I'm not even saying that you shouldn't. But I am telling you this, that you are wholly inadequate to understand the answer. I just imagine if God God had said to Job, well, Job, one day I was assembling with the host of heaven, and Satan came, and Satan mentioned you by name, and I'd have been like, and you said no, right? No, actually, I said, have at it. And then that wasn't enough. And so he came back to me and said, can I have another go at it? And you said, no, right? No, I told him that he could do, I could do, told him he could do everything but kill you. Oh, I wish you would have let him do that. Then I'd be out of my misery. Anybody ever found yourself in such a place? You say, I wish I could just lay down and die. 
That's where Job was, questioning the power of an almighty God who has saw blessing on the end of this. You see, when Job gets to the end, when you get to the end of the book of Job, and Job walks through the questioning of God, and then Job prays and forgives his friends, then Job's life is blessed twofold in comparison to what it was before the things befell him. But you see, you have to understand, when I'm talk, dealing with the God of the universe, I may not understand what the end result is going to be. I just see myself right here, right now. And in this moment, I question how he has used his power. And I know I look around this room today, and I see people that at different times in your life, you have looked at the situations around you, and you say, why me? And I don't know that that's a bad question to ask. But I would also ask you, why not you? Why me? Why them? I, I, I don't understand God's choosing. I don't understand the God's rationale because his ways are not my ways. He is beyond me. But I do know this. If I trust that he is the all-powerful God of the universe who created the end from the beginning, who is both the author and the finisher of my faith, then I know that I can trust him with the power that he has. Instead of me sometimes looking and saying, God, would you give me some power? I said, God, I just trust you and your use of it. So we're a church, that we're a people, we're a, we are a people that look to God and we say, God, why do you do what you do and why don't you do otherwise? And if only I could and if I were God, if I had the means, then everything would be different. But I think God in his wisdom knew what you would do and so where you find yourself now. You see, you got to understand this, where you are right now is largely because of the choices that you've made leading up to this point. I'm not saying nobody has ever done anything wrong to you. I'm not saying that no one has ever abused or stolen or lied or manipulated, and that caused a change in the course of your life, and you could be. I, that stuff happens. Let's be very, very honest. But in large part, for many of our lives, when I look at where I am now, it's because of the power that I do have, I wielded maybe poorly, and here I am. So God looks at us sometimes and says, well, if I give you more, you'll just do the same thing with it. You know, if I had money, well, you've had money. What have you done with it? If I had time, there's 24 hours in a day. We all have the same time. What have we done with it? You see, God has given us power in, great, in a great many things. We just want a different kind of power than what God has already given us. We question the power and wisdom of God. We lament his choices, but we often ignore the power that he gave us. And we ignore that our current situation is the result of us wielding the power that we do have. See, sometimes we look at our circumstances and we say, well, you know what? This is somebody else's fault. But is it really somebody else's fault? I'm not saying it's never, but I'm saying more often than not, it's my fault. Many of you look at your spouse and perhaps you've had an argument with them and you wonder, why couldn't I have married somebody better than you? Well, it's because of your insufficiencies. That's the best you could get. <laughs> when you consider, men, husbands, when you consider your wife's flaws and you complain about them, that's the reason she married you. Ouch. <laughs> Instead of complaining about it, you know what? If she didn't have those flaws, she would have done better than you. Be grateful for those flaws. Every flaw my wife has is the reason that she married me and not somebody more well-to-do. And so I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Thank you, baby, for settling. So we have power. We have power of choice. Joshua 24, 15, where he looks to the children of Israel and he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have the power to choose. No one has taken that away from you in regards to your relationship with God. Perhaps your ability to choose something else out in the world has been taken from you. I won't argue with that. But when it comes to your relationship with God, you have the power to choose. 
And some of us chose poorly, perhaps in our teens and in our early 20s, and now we pay the price of a choice that we made. But you know what? You can make the choice again right now today. You are not bound by a choice from three years ago. You now can choose. He, did, he, did, he says, choose you this day. Listen, I understand some of you were acting a fool with the golden calf. Don't worry about that. Choose right now. I understand some of you grumbled and complained on the other side of Jordan, but choose right now. You see, God gave you the power. God gave you the power to choose. So we look at this world that we live in and we look at the circumstances that are around us and we pray for the power of God. But let me tell you, the first place you're going to find power with God is in choosing him. Not choosing a preacher, not choosing one verse over another verse, not choosing convene. No, 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 no. God, I choose you. I'm going to choose power. I'm going to choose a relationship with God. And if through that relationship God grants me power, I will accept it. But if not, talked about this verse uh, just last week, but there's a story in the book of Acts in the 19th chapter. We're talking about having relationship or having power. And there's a man, he, there was a certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcist, that took upon them power. To call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. They saw the disciples doing miracles. And these were Jews that practiced exorcism. Okay? They, were, they, they practiced witchcraft. And they said, these Jews who follow Jesus have a certain power. We would like to latch on to the power that they've got. And so they go and they begin to practice and they say, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. They didn't even know Jesus. They just knew that Paul had power and Paul knew Jesus. You know, sometimes we go to the Lord in prayer or we come against our enemy and we say, I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus whom grandma told me about. But we don't know Jesus. We just know grandma talks about him. I had, Satan, get out of here in the name of the one that pastor talks about on Sunday. And the devil looks at us and says, hold up. I don't know that you have any authority here. There were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? You see, I know who you're referencing. And I know the other man that you're referencing. We've heard his name mentioned in hell. But you know what? I've not heard your name. Because I don't think you have any relationship with the name you're calling on. You see, many of us want to pray. We want to declare the blessings of God and the things of God. We want to declare the name of Jesus over our finances and over our health and over our babies and over our jobs and upon everything that is in our lives. But sometimes I think the enemy looks at us and says, why are you calling upon the name of someone you don't even have a relationship with? And many of us are weak and impotent in our prayer lives. And there is no power because we have fallen out of relationship with the one of whom we preach. Amen. We've fallen out of love of, with the one whose name we call. The name over which we bless our food. The name over which we call in baptism. The name over which we start and end our days. The name of Jesus that is higher than every other name. The name that under heaven is given all authority. But if I don't have a relationship with the name, if I don't have a relationship with the one. You see, Matthew 28, 19, that we opened with, that Jesus said, look, I want you to go and I want you to baptize all the nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the disciples said, when they got to Pentecost in, the, in Acts chapter 2, when people stood up and said, how are we saved? Then Peter said, you see, I, understood, I heard what he said, but I've got a relationship with the name. I've got a relationship with the one that spoke those words to me. So he stands up and says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Paul was not one to get it wrong. Paul was not one to make a mistake at this moment. So Paul stands up and he begins to boldly declare the name of the one whom he has a relationship with. I'm calling you into relationship with Jesus. I'm curious, do you have a relationship with the one? Do you have a relationship with the name? Do you have a relationship with the one who has the power? Or do you just want the power? I remember as kids, we'd play cops and robbers, and somebody would be doing the illegal. Stop, and we'd say, stop in the name of the law. Well, I don't have a relationship with the law, so I'm not going to stop. If I had a relationship with the law, do you think I'd be breaking into this house to begin with? If I had a respect for the powers that be, do you think I would be engaging the activity that I'm engaging with right now? I have no relationship with that power, so therefore I don't recognize that power. So we go through life and we ask God to do and we ask God to move, but we sometimes have no power. But I wonder if it's because we don't have a relationship with the name. Why else might we not have power in our prayer? Well, in James 4, first, second and third verses, he says, You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and you war and you have not because you ask not. Some of you don't have power because you've not asked for power. Some of you have no authority because you've not asked for authority. But then he follows it up and says, You ask when you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your pleasures. Here's the thing. If I say, God, send us revival and send us miracles so that I can go to conferences and people pat me on the back and ask me how I did it. God, if you would grow this church so that I could grow my paycheck. God, if you could grow this church so that people could look at us and want to have what we have and be who we are. If I'm asking for power for the wrong reasons, let me tell you, I'm not going to have it. It's like the gifts of the Spirit. When he tells us to covet the best gift, which gift of the Spirit is the best gift of the Spirit to have? Which one is it? I've always said the best gift of the Spirit is the one that's necessary in the moment. If I need healing, then please don't come to me with a word of wisdom. If I need an answer, please, please get out of here with your miraculous. I need a word right now. Get out of here with your gift of leadership if I need generosity. Get out of here with your faith if I need empathy right now. You know what gift we need? We need the best gift for the moment. And so when we seek for the church to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, then we say, God, let the gifts of the Spirit be unleashed in this building in the manner that you would desire for them to move, for the needs to be met that are present in this service. I appreciate the fact that when people aren't going to be at church, you let us know and you'll send a text message. But my wife and I have a rule. She'll start getting text messages on Sunday morning. And uh, she doesn't want me to say this. She starts getting stressed out. And then she starts telling me who's not going to be at church today. And I always tell my wife, I say, baby, I can't preach to the people that aren't there. So I love you and I miss you if you're not here. But you know what? It's on you to go find the podcast or go find the live stream or to reorganize your life so that you can be at church on a Sunday morning. Because I don't preach to the people who aren't here. And I just believe that the people who are in the room are the people that God needs to move and minister to. Well, so-and-so is sick and they need a healing. Then they need to get themselves to the house of God. Well, so-and-so is struggling and they need an answer. Well, they need to find their way into the house of God. That's where they need to be. Forsake not the assembling together of the body. See, I want the word and I want the power. I don't want that verse, though. See, we do this. We pick and choose with Scripture, don't we? Brother Peter can come to the music because then I'll be quiet. Because I got way more notes than... But we do this thing where we say, God, I want to see gifts. I want to see the miraculous. I want to see miracles. And then God will say, I'll tell us, love your brother. And we're like, no, 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 not, not, not that one. We pick and choose. We ask, and we ask for the wrong reasons. We ask without faith. There was the story of the man who brought his uh, son to 
be delivered and the disciples couldn't deliver him. And so Jesus said, look, it's because of your unbelief. Because I say, if you have faith like the grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed. Get out of here and it'll go. Nothing shall be impossible to you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Even here, Jesus made a point of saying that even with great faith, some things won't happen without prayer and fasting. Even with the ability to believe, if I have not cultivated a relationship with God, I still will not have the power to do what God requires me to do. We need faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to feed your faith. Let me tell you this. I think that you need to be at church on a Sunday morning. I think, and I understand that there are some people who work jobs and it does not allow you to be here on a Sunday morning and I'm appreciative. If you find a way to watch it on the podcast, maybe you're sitting in a firehouse right now watching it on a live stream. I am so appreciative that you still take time to be in the house if you can't be in the house. But let me tell you this. If you got trouble getting to church on Sunday morning, then you know what? You need to work on what your Saturday night routine looks like. You need to do it. You need to set your alarm clock. You need to set your clothes out. The only reason we are here on time on a Sunday morning is because my wife goes through the trouble of setting out our children's clothes on Saturday night and getting us ready for Sunday morning. That's the only reason we make it on time. And we live three blocks away, guys. But Sunday morning alone is not enough. You need a daily habit of consuming the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I sometimes, when I prepare a Sunday morning sermon, I have a certain conviction when I begin to look at my notes and I begin to see that there's a lot more of me and a whole lot less of Scripture. And if there's ever a Sunday where you're like, man, you're using a lot of Scripture today, Pastor. Good. It's smarter than I am. It's more powerful than I am. It has the ability to set you free and break your chains. It has the ability to heal and restore and deliver. The Word of God has that, not me. But the Bible does say, how will they hear without a preacher? You need a church. You need a preacher. You need a pastor. You need accountability in your life. Let me tell you this. Power without accountability is reckless. Power without accountability is reckless. Some of us would look and say, well, I want power with God, but I don't want to have submission to spiritual authority. Then, my friend, you don't want power. You don't want that. I know you think you do, but you would be wrong. So we look at all these, our circumstances, and we want power, but are we really willing to do what it takes to have power? Why don't I have power? Why, don't, why aren't my prayers answerable? Because you don't ask, and when you do ask, you ask amiss. And when you do ask, you ask without faith. Or you do ask, but you ask without a relationship with God. I admire the saints of old that when they pray, God moves. But it's not because I think God was any more powerful in a generation gone by. But it's because I see men and women that I know they have a relationship with the source. I want to have power. Not for my sake, but for His sake. I want to have authority. Not for me. But so that I can be in submission to Him. Next week, Brother Tim Green is going to be here, and he's going to preach. And if you've ever been in a service with him, let me, let me tell you this for those of you that, that know Brother Green. He's used mightily in the gifts of the Spirit. But not every service is the same. So if you come next week and you sit there and you say, impress me, I promise you, you will get little to nothing out of that service. If you come the next week and you say, I'm only moving if he speaks to me, then you're going to miss the entire point of the service. 
Because if God moves upon his heart and the only thing he does is preach a sermon and the gifts don't operate, then you need to be willing to hear the word of God that has power and not just look for a show. Because it's the word that has the power. We sometimes associate it's that particular minister that has power. No, it's not. It's the word that has the power. And if that minister has a relationship with the name and a relationship with the word, then he's going to be used in power. But you know what? You need to come ready to receive whatever God pours out. So don't come next week looking to be impressed, looking for a show. Don't even come next week looking for a word. This is what you need to do. You need to come next week looking to entertain the presence of God and let God do whatever God wants to do in this house next week. Where does power come from? Power comes from submission. It comes from submission to the Word of God. You know, we do this thing. We, we talk about blessings and power. And we, Well, why aren't my finances blessed? Well, you know, Malachi 3, he tells us, will a man rob God? But if you'll bring your tithe to the storehouse, he says, I'm going to rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'm going to give you power. He doesn't say, I'm going to bless you beyond all imagination and that you'll be so wealthy that Jeff Bezos will be jealous. He doesn't say that, but he says there's a blessing that comes with submission to the things of God. There's power that comes in submission. He says, children, honor your parents that your days may be long upon the earth. You want to have a relationship with God? Teenagers, have a good relationship with your parents. All the parents are saying it, even if they're not saying it out loud. All the parents are saying amen. And half the teenagers are thinking, no offense, parents, thinking things like, but my parents are dumb. Doesn't matter. Let's assume they are. You're not. But let's assume for argument's sake that they are. Honor your father and mother. It doesn't say honor your father and mother unless they're dumb. It doesn't say honor your father and mother unless they ask you to do inconvenient things. It doesn't say honor your father and mother when they ask you to do the things that you enjoy. It says honor your father and your mother. That's what the Word of God says. Teenagers, you want a relationship with God? You get in submission to your parents. You want authority with God? You get in relationship with your mom and dad. And it doesn't matter what your friend's mom or dad does or teaches or allows. Because the Bible doesn't say honor your friend's parents. It says honor your parents. I told you I was going to pastor a little bit today and I saved it for the very end, okay? And I saw some of you teenagers clap, so. I'm not making any eye contact with any of y'all though. Is he talking about me? Yes. I want power. I want authority. I want to walk in that dimension of authority that God gave me. Then you need to get in alignment with what God says. Obey those that have rule over you, for they watch for your souls. The first key, one of the keys to power in the Spirit is submission to authority. That's why we have in this world, if you're going to go and you're going to be in law enforcement, you're going to go through, you're going to go through training and then you're going to swear an oath to the Constitution. You're going to be in the military. You're going to swear an oath to the Constitution. You're going to make a statement that there is an authority over me by which I operate. And without that, I have no power. Our president places his hand upon a Bible. Every one of them so far, at least place their hand on a Bible, and they promise that they're going to uphold the Constitution. They swear by a higher power. They understand that their authority only comes because somebody else has authority. You know who the first place you need to be in a submission to? It's not me. It's the Word of God. It's the things of God. It's the Scripture that's poured out. It's opened up to us. 
I want you to go home. I want you to read the book of Corinthians. I want you to read in Corinthians 12 about how we're many members of the body. I want you to read about the gifts of the Spirit that are poured out in it. But you know what I want you to do when you, after you read about the gifts of the Spirit? I'm not going to go here today. This is what I want you to do. I want you to read it, but then I want you to read the chapter before it, and I want you to read the chapter after it. And understand, you can't take one without the other. He talks about love. He talks about how I can speak with tongues of men and angels, but if I don't have love, it's a waste. God did not include that passage for weddings. He included that passage so we could understand the way in which we wield power. And that's through love. But go read 1 Corinthians 11. And read it in relationship to power. But we want to segment it out. I want the gifts of the Spirit, but I don't want to do any of this other stuff that God requires me to do. I want the power and the authority of the word, but I don't want to separate myself. God says you don't get to have both. You can have power, but your power comes with a relationship with me. There are people in this world that seek power, but they seek it through witchcraft and they seek it through other means. Again, I'm I'm stepping on toes today. That's okay. We do this. We negotiate with God. We barter with God. I, guys, I know I have gone long the past two Sundays, and I apologize for that. But we do this thing where we say, why would an all-powerful, all-loving God, why would he allow or why would he require? Has anybody ever asked that question of Scripture? Why would God care about that? Why would God care about that? That's not the right question. Let me ask you this. Here, let me give you a better question to ask. Better question is this. How does the holy God allow me to enter into his, relate, into his presence? Why would a God without blemish allow me, of all people, to have a relationship with him? Why would he allow that? Do you ever ask that question? Or do we question why we don't have the thing we wish we had? I know what we do. I know how we operate. But instead, we say, God, I want the power, but I don't want the relationship. I want the authority, but I don't want the submission. It doesn't work that way. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Jesus. God, I understand a portion of the word preached today is attractive and a portion of the word preached today is enviable and it's something that we would desire in our lives. But I also understand that I am edging up against some uncomfortable realities and some uncomfortable truths. I also, I understand that, God. And I can feel the tension in the room even as someone begin to look and they say, well, is he going to address this or is he going to address that? Is he it's some, some desiring that I would, some fearing that I would? But God, I pray that right now in this room and these people, that we would make ourselves vulnerable to you, knowing that you have all power all authority and God I seek only to act as an agent of your love God you see those in this room today perhaps you see children perhaps you see teens God that there is a strained relationship between parents and there is a question of why don't I feel what I need to feel in my relationship with God Lord I pray that you would help to begin to restore relationships God, perhaps there are some people, God, that they have wandered away. They have taken a step away 
from certain consecrations that they have made to you. God, in pursuit of liberty, but God, in pursuit of liberty, they have exchanged the power and the relationship with you that you would desire for them to have. God, I pray that this word, that you said your yoke is easy and your burden is light. God, you said that what you place upon us is compassion and kindness, Lord. And I pray, God, that we would have an understanding that the things you require of us is for our benefit and not to our detriment. Church, I understand that and I'm with you. I want power. I want authority. I want the gifts of the Spirit. I want the miraculous to move. I want prayers to be answered. I, I want cancers to fall off. I want depression to be lifted. I want addictions to be broken. I want marriages to be... I want to see the power of God on full display. But I don't want it if I don't have a relationship with him. Talking about the secret of power and the secret of authority and the secret of having the gifts of the Spirit, but I'm telling you what the secret is. The secret is submission. It's submission first and foremost to the Word of God. Would you join me this morning? Would you stand? And if you, I would say if you want power and if you want authority, and if you want dominion, then make your way to this front. But that's not what I'm going to ask. If you're willing to submit to the word of God in your life, then I invite you to this altar. God, I want to submit to the uncomfortable passages. God, I want to submit to the inconvenient instruction. God, I want to submit myself to the aspects of Scripture that they're uncomfortable in this modern age. God, I want authority, but I understand that authority only comes through submission. Oh, could we begin just to pray all across this house as they begin to worship, as they begin to sing?
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The entire Christian walk is centered around submission. Submit to your elders. Submit to your parents. Husbands, submit to your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. It's in the posture of our worship that it's a posture of surrender. It's in the posture of our prayer with our knees bent, our head bowed. The entirety of our relationship with God is centered around acknowledging the fact that we are not in charge. We are not in control. And if my relationship with God ever moves away from knees bent, head bowed, arms lifted, if my relationship with God ever moves away from that, then I am out of alignment with Him. All these things, they're reciprocal. If I'm having trouble with submission to God, I'm going to have some trouble with submitting to authority. But if I am willfully rejecting authorities in my life, then I'm going to have trouble submitting to God. But I have to choose. Who will I serve? You're not serving me. You're not serving some organization that I carry a card with. Him. And submission to His Word is not a matter of convenience or comfort. It's a matter of respect for His Word. A couple of weeks ago, I invited you all to engage in some prayer and fasting. And I've heard various reports of people whether giving up a meal or, or, or a day or whatever it is. But this week, I want to again invite you for a time of prayer and fasting. Give something to God. Maybe you need to go delete your social media apps for the week. Maybe you want to pick a day. Maybe you want to pick a meal whatever it might be. I'm not picky about it. But let's focus ourselves in on Him and say, God, I'm having the expectation that this Sunday I want to be so laser focused on whatever it is, whatever it is that you choose to do. How many of you will join me in that this week? God bless you, Calvary Church. Lowell, I love you. Don't forget, life groups this Wednesday. We're going to have an awesome time meeting. Only three more weeks left. We love you guys. We'll see you at life groups and next Sunday morning at 